Alrighty. So everyone, all right. So uh, last Wednesday we were talking about query evaluation. Uh, today we're going to continue that discussion with a little bit um, on extending query evaluation to handle the memory hierarchy properly. Um, before I get into that, however, a little bit of uh, news. So a couple of people have uh, expressed a little bit of com confusion on how to get started uh, with the project. And mainly to ease the, the sort of transition of, of getting off the ground there, I've been putting up some uh, very basic demo videos on uh, sort of where, where to look for documentation, uh, where to uh, sort of start developing. Um, these are all posted on Piazza now. Uh, there's also a, a YouTube playlist that I've been posting the uh, class recordings to as well. Um, so hopefully those will uh, get you off the ground a little bit uh, further. Uh, there's been a little more TA re reshuffling. Uh, Niccolo is now the uh, only project uh, TA. Uh, Zuan, uh, Zuan uh, is now working uh, for a different course. Uh, and finally, a quick reminder, uh, homework two, assignment two, uh, is going to be due on Monday, and I should have grades, uh, we should have grades posted for you within the next couple of days for uh, assignment one. Uh, so before I get on to the, uh, the content for today, uh, are there any sort of outstanding questions about the project at this stage? All right, uh, is that a hand? All right, so let's, um, let's get on to it. I'd like to start with a little bit of recap uh, from a couple of days ago. Uh, first off, uh, because we're dealing with the memory hierarchy and uh, specifically the various lower, level, um, uh, lower levels of the memory hierarchy, I want to do a quick recap on um, some of the terminology that we're using uh, with hardware. So for a typical hard disk drive, uh, a typical hard disk drive is composed of several platters, uh, circly cylindrical things uh, that store your data. Uh, every platter can have one, or, either one or two surfaces, top and bottom. Each surface has uh, some number of tracks, and uh, every track has some number of blocks. Um, a couple of other terms. Sector represents all of the sort of co, uh, the, the, um, the tracks in the same arc. And uh, cylinder represents all of the tracks uh, in the same position, but on different surfaces. Every disk head has, uh, sorry, every uh, disk surface has a uh, disk head, which reads from that surface. And uh, while there are multiple disk heads, typically only one of them will ever read uh, at any given time. In order to read from a disk, again, just to recap, you have uh, the disk basically spinning around, um, and there are three costs involved in reading from a disk. Uh, the first is that you need to uh, move the head into the correct position above the right track, or all of the heads into the position over the right cylinder. Um, that's typically referred to as the seek time. Uh, the disk will then continually spin. It takes a fraction of a second uh, to move the disk into the right position uh, so that the, the block that you're interested in reading uh, is under the disk head. That's uh, typically referred to as rotational delay. And there's uh, the, the head stays in place as the disk continues to spin, allowing the head to read off the block. Uh, this is typically referred to as the access time. Solid state disks are uh, pretty much the, the same, or at least uh, similar. Uh, the only difference is that because there's no moving parts, there's no rotation, uh, you don't actually have a seek or a, um, or a, rotation, uh, a seek time or a rotational delay. Uh, you issue the read, and then there is some amount of time until the read completes. You issue a write, and there is some amount of time until the write completes. Uh, one thing uh, I would like to highlight, however, is that typically in a flash disk, there's um, the, the way the flash disks are set up, 
you have essentially every block is an array of bits. You have one operation, uh, one operation that uh, allows you to erase individual bits. So you can take uh, any bit that is in this block and set it uh, from zero, uh, sorry, from one to zero. Um, and the, uh, <clears throat> the other operation that you have is to set a whole block or multiple blocks worth of bits uh, from zero to one. So you can uh, essentially erase, you have to erase multiple blocks at the same time, whereas you can uh, write to individual bits. Uh, this kind of uh, promotes a, a, a sort of append only write pattern. Uh, this erasure process also tends to damage the flash disk, so oftentimes you'll have this notion, uh, what, what's called wear leveling, that spreads the writes around uh, to uh, avoid damaging, uh, writing to the same block over and over again. So any questions on the hardware? Recap. All right. Uh, one other bit of recap. Uh, we talked, uh, this a little more recent, we talked on Monday about relational operators and how you could use relational operators as uh, a stand-in uh, for the execution, uh, the, the plan, uh, as a stand-in for, for the process that you can use uh, to evaluate a, a, a relational query. Um, and to recap, the, the core relational algebra operators that we talked about both on Monday and uh, the, the Wednesday prior to that uh, were project, select, join, union, and sort of the base relations that you're, you're operating over. Uh, we also extended that on Monday with uh, the aggregate and group by aggregate operators. And we talked about uh, some operators specialized for working on lists. Uh, so relational algebra typically operates on sets or bags. Uh, there are two operators that are specific to lists, uh, sort and limit. Any questions on relational algebra? Great. I want to say great. You guys are a tough crowd. All right. Just send my shark out into the audience. Okay. So, we talked, the main focus of the discussion on Monday was uh, evaluating queries, or more precisely, evaluating relational algebra operators. Now, when we talked about this on Monday, the focus was mostly on in-memory evaluation, um, sort of giving you guys a uh, baseline for what you could do, use uh, to implement checkpoint one. Today we're going to talk a little bit uh, more about uh, specialized uh, operator uh, evaluation techniques uh, that take into account the memory hierarchy and specifically that allow us to uh, deal with a limited amount of memory. Uh, as I said in the very first lecture, the, the goal here is to try and get uh, data as close to the CPU as possible. Um, the closer you are to the CPU, the more, uh, the more efficient the, uh, the, the data processing you can do. And unfortunately, the, the downside there is that as you get closer to the CPU, uh, the, you get less and less memory to work with. So there's, there's kind of two general strategies that uh, the approaches that I'm going to talk about today uh, focus on. Uh, one is to, well, if, if you can only work with a small amount of data, make sure you're only working with a small amount of data at any given time. So half of the, the approaches focus on minimizing what's called the working set, the amount of data that you're, uh, you have active at some point in time. And the second is to try and make the most use of what data you do have uh, in memory or as, as close to the CPU as possible. Um, aggressively reuse that. And the nest block nested loop join that I, I briefly discussed uh, is one example of that kind of approach, where you still need to use that data over and over again, but by pushing it up, uh, by aggressively reusing it, you can uh, get more mileage out of the, uh, the data once it's been loaded. OK, so uh, quick, let's, let's wake you guys up a little. Uh, some quick recaps. Uh, projection. 
you can implement projection very easily to the, this is a textual version of the animation that was up last uh, last class. Uh, you can implement projection by reading one tuple, projecting away the attributes that you need, and then emitting the tuple. What's the working set size here? Yeah. One tuple at a time. Good. A selection operator. Same deal. You read one tuple, you figure out whether it satisfies the, the condition. If it does, you emit it. If it doesn't, you reject it. Working set size? One tuple. Great. Good. You guys are waking up. Um, all right. Uh, union. Same basic deal. You read from R as long as you, uh, R union S, you read from R as long as you have tuples to read. Uh, as soon as you run out of tuples in R, you start reading from S. What's the working set size here? One, yeah, one tuple, good. Um, so same basic deal. These are really, really nice operations. Uh, relation. I have a data file, I have to read in a record, then I have to split that record into individual fields, and then I have to parse the field types. Assuming that I can do each of these in as little memory as possible, working set size, All right, last one uh, as a bit of a recap. Uh, nested, uh, uh, regular nested loop join. I read one tuple and basically scan through, uh, read one tuple from S. If I have a tuple, uh, if I don't have any more tuples to read from S, then I read another tuple from R, I reset S and start again. Either way, I read a tuple from S then I join it with the last tuple that I read from R. Working set size? Two tu yes, two tuples. Um, now there's a caveat here, which is that this is a rather inefficient problem. So how many times am I going to see uh, a given tuple in R? Once. Okay, so I have to load every tuple in R in memory exactly once. How about how many times do you have to load a, a tuple in from S, however? So, yes. So for every, uh, every tuple in R, I need to load in uh, that tuple uh, from S once again. So my working set size is small, but I'm making very poor use of my memory bandwidth because I need to keep loading data in from R. And we'll get back to this. Aggregation. I have to read a tuple. I add it to my aggregate, and then I repeat the process as long as I have more tuples to read. What's my working set size here? One tuple. Size of the relation. Do I need the entire relation in memory? I hear a little confusion here. That's good, because this is a bit of a trick question. It depends on what kind of aggregate I'm working with here. Let's say the aggregate that I'm working with is a sum. Size of, size, do I, why do you say that? Why do you, uh, so there's an answer, the size of the, uh, the entire relation. Uh, why do you say that? Okay, so you, you need to, uh, the, the claim is that you need to load the entire relation in. Do you need the entire relation in memory at any given time, however? No. So how, what, is, what would the working set size here be? One tuple plus size of the state that I need for the aggregate, yes. So in order to store this, I'd need uh, a sum. I'd need one, uh, one integer or one floating point number uh, and then one tuple worth of memory. Good. Um, what about uh, average? Same. Uh, I'll, I'll give it to you. It's the same, but uh, you need two integer, uh, two floats or two integers. Uh, so I need both the count and the, the sum. Uh, what about um, what about median? Yeah. Okay. So we'll we'll get back to this in a little bit. 
there are actually some aggregates that you can't do uh, quite this efficiently. All right, group by aggregate. Given the answer to the previous one, this should be fairly easy. What's my working set size? Size of? Yes, the number, so I need one, uh, one aggregate value for every single group that I'm constructing. So if I'm computing the sum, I need one integer or one floating point number uh, per group. Great. So you may have noticed the first couple of algorithms here that I described, or the first uh, couple of operators that I described here, were um, very simple. They had very small working set sizes, one tuple at any given time. But there were a couple that really didn't play into this, um, uh, that really didn't play into this uh, uh, limited memory uh, view that we, we would like to be, be using. Um, join, so join, uh, nested loop join had a very small working set size, but as we, uh, as we discovered, it uses memory very inefficiently. So we'd like some ways of, uh, some better algorithms for computing joins. Uh, the group by aggregate, that has uh, a number of, um, the working set size there scales with the number of groups. Again, we'd like to have a slightly more uh, memory conscious, or, or we'd like to use a bounded amount of memory for that, or at least be able to use a bounded amount of memory. What about sorts in general? How, uh, what's the space complexity of a sort? Yeah. So in general, uh, in order to, uh, to sort a relation, you need to have all of it accessible at once. So the outline of today's talk is basically, I'm going to go over these three different operators, and we're going to talk about how to, uh, how different ways of approaching these operators, different ways of implementing them uh, to take advantage, uh, to try and minimize the amount of memory that we're using, or more precisely, to minimize the amount of information that we need to move up and down the memory hierarchy. Now, one concept I want to uh, lightly touch on, because it and it connects very deeply uh, to a lot of these algorithms, is this notion of a hash function. So uh, show of hands, who's uh, been exposed to hash functions before? OK, a fair number of you. Uh, so s just for those of you who, who haven't been exposed, um, a hash function basically is uh, a function that is both deterministic and random. Um, that is to say, it produces a number that, from all appearances, is random. But the, the number that it produces is deterministically related to its input. So if, and that input can be pretty much anything. So for example, I could take a string, Bob, Alice. I could feed uh, Bob, the, the string Bob, to a hash function, and I'd get back a number. And that number would be random uh, from all, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, 53. Bob hashes to 53. But the, the important thing is that every single time I evaluate this function on Bob, I get back the same number. It's random, in a sense, but I get the same value every single time. So it gives me a little bit uh, the best of, of both worlds, both uh, randomness uh, that I can use for uh, well, for some of the, the properties, uh, some of the algorithms rely on having this sort of random allocation of, of objects uh, to um, to bins. So this works very nicely in partitioning, but uh, because it's deterministic, I don't actually need to save anything. Um, I can get this nice random distribution of values to partitions, but at the same time, get uh, at the same time I don't need to save anything, which is which means my working set size can say can stay small. Now, what we're talking about today kind of falls under the heading of uh, you'll hear it in. Uh, referred to in a couple of different ways. Um, the most common two expressions are external algorithms or out-of-core algorithms. 
Either way, uh, you have a certain amount of memory that you're working with, and the idea is to give yourself the ability to scale beyond uh, what you have the, the memory capacity uh, to handle at some given point in time. And to rephrase the, the two approaches I described earlier, uh, you can think of the first approach as being a form of streaming. So as long as I keep my working set size to one, I never need to, um, I'm, I'm basically doing the best thing that I can. Um, I never, because my working set size doesn't scale, I'm already fulfilling the, the criteria of, of the, such an external output. The other approach, uh, if, if everything doesn't fit in memory, well, the only other thing that you can do is break up your, your data set into smaller chunks and try and process each chunk individually. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do this, and the, the most effective uh, here are uh, partitioning either by uh, some sorting process where I uh, pick specific points, where I sort my data and then pick specific points uh, to split the data, um, or in the other case, where I, I partition the data by hashing it and picking a bin based on uh, the, the, ha the number that, I, that my hash function computes uh, for the data. In either case, the, the important takeaway is that I have a deterministic uh, way to allocate uh, values to bins. And that's important because if it's deterministic, I don't need to save uh, all that much information in memory in order to be able to figure out which bin a particular object belongs in. And that, in turn, uh, means that I, my working set size stays small. So any question on the general concept of keeping your, your memory sizes small? Yes? That is a great question. I'm, I'm, in fact, quite glad that you asked. So, um, how do we, the, the obvious question is, how do you sort, uh, how do you deal with, um, the, the sort of fundamental problem is sorting your data. How do you sort your data without having enough memory to actually hold all of your data, or at least minimizing the amount of uh, data that you, uh, that you touch when you sort. So uh, the first thing I'm going to introduce here uh, and, uh, is an algorithm for sorting your data without actually uh, sorting your data when you don't have enough memory uh, to hold all of your data. Now this algorithm is uh, a multi-pass algorithm. So it's going to touch all of the data values multiple times. Um, and I'm going to make a couple of assumptions here. Namely, first, that you load the data in uh, uh, the granularity of pages. So I have a, a page or a block of data. I'm going to load in all of the records uh, in that block. I'm also going to assume that I can hold multiple records per block. Quick show of hands, uh, just out of curiosity, who has uh, encountered merge sort? Good. Okay, so this this algorithm should actually be uh, quite intuitive to you, I hope. Uh, so the first pass of this algorithm, we have a whole bunch of pages on disk, and all of those pages contain unsorted uh, in for unsorted data. By the way, what's the memory, uh, what's the working set size of merge sort? Think about that. I'll get back to the question in another slide or so. So the first uh, two-way sort operates basically in what you can think of as two phases. Uh, multiple passes over the data, uh, but the first phase uh, operates on the first pass, the second phase operates on all the subsequent passes. So the first thing we need to do, we need to take our data and we need to uh, organize it. Uh, we need to get at least a little bit of order in our data. Uh, 
And so the first phase is going to load one page at a time, take the contents of that page, sort it, sort just that one page, and sync it back to disk. What's the working set size here? One page, great. So it's going to sort the page, and then it's going to flush it back to disk. All right, now we have a whole bunch of pages, each of which is individually sorted. So for every subsequent phase, what we're going to do is we're going to load in the contents of uh, two pages. And you'll note that these buffers, that these uh, pages are now sorted. So if I have two sorted pages, I can read from them, and I can merge them together uh, into two additional uh, two new pages, which are sorted. But how many pa what's the working set size here? Two pages. Uh, two pages or so you need two pages to read in. You also need one page at least uh, to store your output, or more precise. How many pages do you need to store your output? Four. Okay. Now, do I actually need four pages, or can I do? Is there a way to do this in three? Yes. Say again. Good. So what you uh, what you can do uh, if you've encountered merge sort, this is exactly how merge sort works. Uh, you take you start reading from the two sorted pages, and you start building up uh, an output buffer. You, you basically can stream the output uh, back to disk. And as soon as you filled up, because you're iterating over the the two input pages in order, you can build uh, an already sorted uh, page as, as your output. As soon as you fill up one of the output pages, you, immediate, you immediately flush it to disk and start working on the second output page. So you only ever need three pages in memory uh, in order to, uh, to, to run this, this kind of merge sort. So in general, you can read a buffer uh, you can read from a, a cluster of pages uh, that is of size k, or uh, that has k pages in it. If I have two such buffers of uh, two buffers of uh, k pages each, I can merge them into two k pages, but I can do that merge process using only three pages of memory. Uh, Actively. Now I repeat this process over and over, and I eventually, uh, every time I uh, double the the, the number, uh, the size of my my buffer. How many times do I actually need to cycle through this process in order to sort, um, let's say, n pages? Log n. Great. So let me take uh, give you a. A uh, more precise example of this. So I have my, my data set here. Uh, it's got a bunch of pages. Data is, as you can see, in very random order. So phase one, as before, I'm going to take all of those blocks of data and I'm going to sort them in place. So you can see, uh, where are we? Shark. Uh, that when uh, 6, 2 becomes 2, 6, um, whereas 3, 4 is already sorted, that doesn't need to change. Um, I'm holding a placeholder here because uh, this works much better if it's, uh, it has a number of pages that's divisible by, uh, that is a factor of, uh, sorry, a power of 2. So I sort the individual pages, and then I can stream, uh, stream my output. Uh, I start with looking at this page and this page. Um, I get the two, I get the three, and I get the four, and then I get the six. And I can, as soon as I get the two and the three, I can output that. Then I can keep outputting the four and the six. Repeat, rinse and repeat, merge the next. I load this block into memory. I load this block into memory. Uh, the two is 
for it comes before everything. The three comes before the next thing. That's one block of output. Uh, I loaded the next page in here. Um, there's a four there. There's a four there. That makes my next page six, seven. Next page. Load the next block in here. Eight, nine, and that's my output. Repeat the process one more time, and I get my fully sorted, uh, my fully sorted uh, list. Three, uh, sorry, four phases, and yeah, three phases. Sorry, four phases, and uh, the entire output has been sorted. And at no point did I have to store more than three pages worth of data uh, in in memory. So let's generalize this a little bit. Three pages is nice. It's a really good lower bound. Uh, I can do this uh, processing in no less than three pages. Uh, I need at least three pages, but a typical computer is going to have, uh, is definitely going to have 24 kilobytes of, of memory. Uh, we would like to be able to use more than this amount of memory. So how, how might we approach this uh, for, for this first phase, for pass one? Uh, how would we exploit the fact that we have more than one uh, page of memory? Hmm? Yep, so this one's uh, this one's straightforward. You load in as many pages of memory as uh, you have space for. Sort that those pages. Uh, we'll get to in a couple of uh, a slide or two. Uh, actually, a nice uh, nice trick that you can use to uh, do this even more uh, to use n buffer frames even more efficiently. But uh, basically, you can load in uh, n pages, sort n pages at once. Uh, congratulations, you've just shaved off a couple of phases worth of work. What about uh, phases two and onwards? Uh, do you get a benefit from having n pages? Okay, so you can sort multiple pages in parallel. You can load things in, and while one set of pages is loading, uh, you can start uh, applying your CPU to a different set of pages. Um, any other ideas? Fewer iterations, okay. Uh, could you explain? Good. So uh, a second uh, a second approach would be that you can. Uh, rather than merging two streams, you can merge three streams. So we've got parallel, we've got uh, multiple streams getting merged at the same time. Um, yeah, let's go with that. Uh, okay, so question for you guys. Let's say we sort, uh, we're, uh, I like five. Um, let's say we have five streams that we need to, uh, that, we have space to load in at a given time. How, uh, how many iterations would it take uh, with five streams? I'm hearing log. That is half. Yes? Hmm? So for two streams, uh, what is the, uh, how many iterations does it take? Log, it, uh, log into the base two. Okay. Uh, what about for five streams? Yep. Uh, one caveat there. Uh, first off, you have to, uh, if you have a non-integer log, well, you have to do a full, uh, a full pass. And the, you also have to do the first pass. So uh, precisely for a K-way sort, you, you can take... Um, it takes you log to the base k of n plus the initial sort one page phase. How many, uh, 
how many I.O. operations, so how many pages do we read and write? So for the first phase, how many pages do we need to read? N. Okay. How many pages do we need to write? N. Okay. For every uh, N is being what? Number of total pages, yes. Uh, what about for every other pass? How many pages do we need to read? N. Okay. So in total, how many IOs, how many total IOs will we need to, to perform? N log N, or sorry, log N. So for each, how many, how many uh, IOs per phase? N, and how many phases? Log N plus one, yeah. So uh, two times the number of, and for every one of those, we need to do both a read and a write. Okay, so uh, we talked about, so we mentioned uh, past, uh, uh, passes to and, and onwards are not really memory limited. It's a, they're very nicely streaming algorithms. If you get more memory, great, you can do them a little more efficiently, but it's pass one that really has this really hard uh, memory limit. So it would be really nice if we could improve the efficiency of pass one, if we could uh, sort even more data uh, than would fit in memory. And I think this, I, I just wanted to bring this up because it's a really nice example of a clever way uh, to make use of memory. And well, it, it works very nicely. Um, so this is, uh, a sorting algorithm that's uh, re uh, that's called replacement sort, and the general idea is that you take um, rather th rather than just admitting defeat and uh, sorting exactly the amount of uh, data that will fit in memory, you save a little bit of space and you try and buffer. Uh, you try and use buffering. Uh, to create sequences of sorted data. Um, this effectively allows you to, uh, yeah, uh, sequences of sorted data, these, uh, also known as uh, runs. So uh, this is best illustrated by example. So what you'll have is, uh, the way this works is that it uses three regions of memory. Uh, one region of memory to be used as an input buffer. And so that's however many pages you want to read in at one time. You have a working set that consists of uh, an array of data values that you're going to sort. And then you have an output buffer which stores the uh, data that you have sorted or have uh, one chunk of data that you've sorted. Now note, this is meant to work with this secondary merge sort. Uh, so this is, this is a replacement for phase one. It's not a replacement for uh, the entire sort process. All we have to do here is uh, generate a sequence of data, uh, generate multiple files, each of which is internally sorted. There's one other data value that we keep track of, and that's a single integer. Uh, we keep a single integer that tells us the last data value that was appended to the output buffer. And I'm going to call that k. So here we have our output buffer. It already has uh, two values in it, 3 and 5. And so our k value is going to be 5, the value of the last thing that we wrote to the output buffer. This algorithm works in uh, a couple of steps. Uh, so the first step we're going to pre-populate our working set. We're going to load uh, all of the data into the working set, and then we're going to make sure that the working set is completely sorted, in sorted order. Now we're going to 
the first step in this process, we're going to take a look at the, the working set, and we're going to find the lowest value that is still greater than k, greater than or equal to k. In this case, that's what? 8, yes. Just making sure you guys are awake. Um, so we find the first, the lowest value that's still greater than k. In this case, that's 8. And we're going to append that to the output buffer. Obviously, now that we've appended it, we need to, uh, we need to update k. Next, we're going to read another value from our input buffer, and we're going to insert it into our working set, and we're going to resort the working set so it's properly in order. Now, we're going to keep doing this. We're going to do the exact same thing over and over again. We're going to keep appending the lowest data value that we encounter that is still greater than the last thing we appended. And we're going to keep doing this as long as there is such a value in our working set. Now you'll note, every time I insert something into the output buffer, because of the way I'm picking values to insert, I'm guaranteed that the value that I insert is always going to be greater than whatever I last inserted. I'm making sure to pick only values that are greater than k, which means I'm always going to append progressively larger values uh, to the output buffer. So that guarantees that the output buffer is sorted. But because of the fact that I keep reading values from my input buffer, I end up, uh, there's a chance that that value that I read from the input buffer is going to be greater than the values that are that have already been appended. That's, I'm, I have a chance that the value that I read is greater than k. And if that happens, then great. I have another value that I can append to my output buffer. And so, uh, was there a question? All right. And so, um, in general, uh, the expected chance uh, that, I, that that will happen, the, the chance that I'll get a value, uh, a new value for my input stream is going to be uh, one in two. About half of the time, I'm going to read a new value that I can still append to my output stream. So if I have n pages of memory and I, or more Precisely, if I have a working set that is n pages, on average, how many pages will I be able to, uh, how, how long will the runs be that I can, cr that I can create? Uh, say again? Uh, 2n, you mean? So I've, uh, if I have n pages, and I've, I've sorted them all, at the very least, I'm going to output n pages worth of sorted data. So going back to this example, um, if my working set here is uh, has n elements in it, then I'm always going to be able to output at least the contents of the working set, the, in, the entire contents of the working set. So that's going to be at least n. Yes? Okay. Um, I see. Okay. Uh, there is a lead into this. The so what is before I've done anything? What value of k do I have? Yeah, uh, so what if, uh, at the very beginning, before I've appended anything, uh, what value of k should I use? Minus infinity. Minus infinity. Okay, so uh, the very first thing that I write is going to be the first thing in my working set, at the very beginning, before I've done anything. Now, once I've done that, is that guaranteed to be smaller than the second thing in my working set? Smaller or equal? So, at the very beginning, 
whatever my initial setup is, I'm going to be able to output at least the entire working set because I'm, I have a list of sorted values. I'm guaranteed that I can output at least those. The gimmick here is that every time I read uh, one of those, uh, every time I output one of those values, I read in another value from my input. And uh, there is a 50-50 chance that that value that I just read is going to be something that I can also, in addition to everything that's already in my working set, there's a 50-50 chance that that new value is also going to be a candidate uh, for outputting. So after, after I've read and output n values, uh, what's, the, um, what's the probability that I'll have another, or how many additional values will I have read in by the time I've finished reading in n values? So after I've read in n values, I've replaced it with n, and how many of those are likely to be useful for me for this current run? n by 2. So after n over 2, uh, so after I've gotten through the entire working set, I will have another n over 2 values that are useful. Now, after I read in those n over 2 values, what's the chance that I'll get some additional values that are useful? n by 4. So it's the the numbers are a little bit uh, more awkward than I'm presenting them, but essentially, you should, uh, on average, this is going to produce runs that are, e uh, that are equal to twice your working set size, um, which is actually kind of cool. You've basically used, you have given yourself twice as much memory as you actually do by cleverly looking at the uh, the precise specifications for the problem that you're trying to solve. OK, any questions on sorts? Uh, out of memory sorts, replacement sort? All right, cool. Let's move on to joins in that case. So. There are two general kinds of joins. One where the join predicate is an equality, RB equals SB. And there's one where uh, the join predicate is an inequality, or some arbitrarily complex formula. Um, these are generally referred to as equi, or equality joins, or inequi joins. Um, how? Would, how do the outputs of these joins differ? Number of columns? OK, so let's, uh, yes, in one case, because uh, you're duplicating, uh, you know that two columns are going to be equal. You can optimistically trim one of the columns out. But um, what about the size? What can we say about the size, the, the arity of uh, the outputs of these joins? Uh, say again? OK. Uh, exactly correct. So a um, inequality join, in general, is go oh, depends on the semantics of the data. But in general, the expectation would be that an inequality join uh, has a uh, output size that is uh, the product of the two relations that go into it. Now, this is not always uh, the case. And it's also possible, uh, it might be the case that an equality join would produce an output that is this bad. Uh, what would be a case where that happens? Can you get a hand? Uh, what would be a case where an equality join produces an output that is on the order of n squared? in terms of size? The, rela the relations or the table? What specifically about the tables needs to be the same? 
Yeah. So in this case, if both R, if R B has precisely one attribute, uh, one value for all of its rows, uh, R dot B is one for every single row, and S dot B is one for every single row, you'll end up with an n squared join. And similarly, there's cases where inequality joins aren't quite as bad as n squared. But in general, um, because equality joins uh, just have so much uh, lower arity, uh, it makes a lot more sense to focus on optimizing equijoins. Um, these also happen to be sort of the, the common case. Uh, if you look at a lot of the, the TPCH queries, um, there are practically no inequality joins in that entire workload. So uh, equality joins are ba both uh, extremely common and extremely amenable to optimization. There's a lot of space uh, where we can uh, do something more efficiently. So what we're going to do today is focus predominantly on, uh, on equality joins. Now we talked about uh, two join algorithms last week. Um, nested, uh, nested loop join and block nested loop join. And block nested loop join. Does anyone need me to recap those? All right. Um, one other thing that I just briefly want to hint at, uh, because this uses material that we haven't covered yet, um, there is one form of join called an index nested loop join. It's quite related to the above, uh, but we'll get back to that soon. I just want to mention it. The uh, there are two. Other, uh, sorry, three other forms of joins that actually help us a lot in a number of, of cases. Um, the first of these is something called sort merge join. And the idea of this join is that you first sort all of your input relations. You make sure that they're sorted on the join attribute. And then and then every single time And then you, all you need to do uh, to perform a join is iterate over those two streams. So kind of like uh, a merge sort, you iterate over the two streams, and every time you hit a tuple that, uh, a attribute that matches one that you've already seen, sorry, iterate them always, uh, always moving down uh, the stream that has the lower value, exactly like merge sort. And every time you hit uh, two different values that are identical, um, you can output them. And as soon as you hit the end of one stream, you know you're never going to get another tuple to join with, so you're done. Um, what is the working set size for this algorithm? Two, uh, two what? Two tuples, yeah. So you never need to look at more than two tuples at any given point in time. Um, when might we want to use this over nested loop join? Can I get a hint? Yes. So if the tuples are already sorted, this is an amazing type of join. Um, if you, uh, one, Command that I encourage you to try uh, if you if you want to play around with uh, some uh, one of these uh, with with database engines is explain. So if you type explain and then a query uh, in MySQL and Postgres and Oracle SQL Server uh, DB2, you will get a enumeration of uh, an explanation of the plan that the database is choosing to use for that particular query. And MySQL loves sort merge joins. Uh, and the reason for that is that a lot of the joins tend to be on, uh, a lot of joins that people do tend to be on uh, columns that are, uh, that are already indexed, primary key columns. Which makes, because they're already sorted, makes this a amazing uh, strategy for, for doing joins. Uh, what are, uh, are there any other situations where this might be a good thing to do. So 
So would we actually want to run a sort for this? Put this another way. What's the time complexity of a sort merge join? N log n, uh, where n is? The number of tuples to be. Uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's n log n uh, plus n2 log n2, uh, for the sum of the two relations. Um, what about nested loop join? What's nested loop join? n squared. Good. OK, so there are some situations where an n log n sort is actually beneficial to you. Uh, sometimes this is when only one of the, the columns is sorted. Uh, sorry, one of the, the relations is sorted. Uh, it might make sense to sort the other relation uh, just because n log n is cheaper than any other options. All right. So sort, it, sort merge join is a very common uh, join implementation in, in database engines. Uh, another one that's also fairly common is called external hash join, um, or sometimes just hash join. Um, there are actually two different types of hash joins. Um, and to make it clear which one I'm talking about, I'm going to say this one is the external hash join. So the idea here is that we're going to take all of the tuples in our streams and we're going to apply our hash function to figure out which bucket uh, that particular tuple belongs in. Then we're going to take all of the tuples and we're going to put them in the appropriate buckets. Now, I'm being a little ambiguous on what I mean by buckets here. Uh, those buckets can either live in memory or they can live on disk. And the beauty of it, uh, how are we... Uh, modifying the buckets. Or how, uh, what kind of um, uh, data access, how are we accessing the buckets during this first pass? Okay, um, so what are, what are we doing? Uh, so we're, we're writing values to the, to the buckets and the only kind of operation we're doing on the buckets is append. Every time we write something to the buckets, we're always appending to the end of the bucket. Uh, and this makes it very nice, uh, very nice for, um, for buffering. Uh, if we have n buckets, how much memory do we need uh, to store all of those buckets? Or more precisely, how much, what is our work, if we have n buckets, what is our working set size? N. Uh, say again? N times the size of the buckets? Uh, okay, do we need the entire bucket in memory though? So how many pages do we actually need in memory per bucket? One, exactly. Uh, as soon as one page in the bucket fills up, we flush it to disk and we don't need to uh, see it again until the second phase. Now in the second phase, uh, we're going to visit each bucket one at a time, and we're going to do a nested loop join over all of the tuples that reside in that one bucket. What are some potential downfalls of this approach? We have to traverse it twice. Um, we have to, for every uh, tuple, uh, sorry, for every page in our input data, we have to uh, read it in, save it back to disk, read it back in, and only then can we produce our outputs. That is a downside. Um, what about the? So how how many? Uh, what's the working set size of the second phase? In the back? So how many pages do we need uh, at any given point in time in the second phase? One, or why do you say one? Hmm? 
So, the, yeah, so the, uh, we can do this in one of two ways. There are, there are two correct answers. Uh, one way is to load the entire bucket into memory, and the other way is to do an out, just a, a nested loop join over the, the buckets that we have, uh, the data that we have in, in those, those buckets. Uh, if we load everything into, the me into memory, of course, we run into the, the possibility that we run out of memory if a bucket gets too big. How might we uh, address that? So if the bucket is too big, what, what can we do about it? Partition the bucket. Yes, save me from having to tear a piece of paper. Uh, we can take the data, uh, the bucket, and we can split it into smaller buckets. How might we do that? So the, the gimmick, uh, a hash function is deterministic. It always produces the same output. But you can potentially have different hash functions. Um, so you can use exactly the same strategy for partitioning as you did in the first case. The only difference is that uh, you'd need to use a different hash function. All right, so the last join algorithm I want to uh, get at uh, today is what's called the hybrid hash, uh, also sometimes referred to as the grace uh, hash join uh, for the grace uh, database system that first implemented this. Uh, the idea here is that you take one of your relations and you read it in entirely and then you hash that one relation. All of the, uh, you build a hash table, uh, build these buckets, but just for one relation. Then, as you read the other uh, you visit the other relation one tuple at a time, figure out which bucket that tuple uh, maps to, and do a nested loop join or whatever is the appropriate kind of join uh, with all of the tuples that are residing in that one hash bucket. Um, what are some advantages of this approach? Or what is the time complexity of this approach? How many times do, uh, let's do this from the I.O. perspective. How many I.O.s uh, do I perform? If I have uh, n, page, n pages in one relation and m pages uh, for the other relation, how many I.O.s do I need to do? n plus n, good. Uh, what's the working set size? Uh, m plus 1 or n plus 1, either way. Uh, so you only need one page from one of the relations, and you need the other relation entirely in memory. Uh, there's a little bit of overhead for the hash table. Hash tables tend to be uh, noticeably larger than, um, than their, uh, the data that you're storing in them, but yes. All right. Um, so when might I use uh, a grace join? Uh, say again? If, yeah, so if I have uh, a hybrid hash join works, uh, works best when one of the two relations fits in memory. If you can fit that entire relation in, into memory, uh, this is a great way to go. Uh, if you can't, well, you either want to use a sort merge or a hybrid hash. And this is actually why MySQL does sort merge join. Uh, sort merge has very little assumptions about memory. If you get a good sort implementation, uh, the rest kind of falls into place. Uh, there we go. So I have this nice handy dandy uh, table uh, that kind of summarizes all of these, uh, these approaches. Um, I don't really expect you to memorize this, but most of it is, is kind of, uh, I, I do expect you to have sort of an intuition or, or an understanding of how these, these values come about. Um, the first column, uh, just to guide you through it, the first column basically says uh, whether or not the uh, working set size is fixed. Um, or, well, 
whether it's memory conscious. Uh, the second uh, memory t requirements we went over, and the last column, one of the drawbacks of the hash and sort based approaches is that they only work for equijoins. Why is that? Why does uh, sort merge join only work for equality predicates? A sort for a sort merge? Well, does sort, sort merge doesn't have a hash table. So what, uh, but you're on the right track. The um, sort merge, <laughs> all right. Um, sort merge only looks at one pair of tuples at any given time. Uh, the, uh, if you have an inequality predicate, uh, one tuple can match against an arbitrary number of tuples in the other relation with a equality predicate, you generally only match against a few tuples. Uh, and both sort merge and hash and the, the various hash join uh, algorithms that we're looking at um, match individual tuples. Uh, hash in particular always maps, uh, the, the advantage of it, the, the way it works is that it always maps the same tuples to the same, or the same uh, attributes to the same buckets. Um, because of the, the way the hash function works, you're guaranteed that that bucket will contain all of the, the um, tuples that you need to compute over. Um, that's not the case if you, uh, if you have an inequality predicate. All right, uh, one last thing. Um, so I met uh, earlier, the very beginning of the talk, uh, there was that trick question on, on aggregates. Um, so, there are a handful of different aggregates, uh, classes of aggregates. Um, these, these aggregates are, uh, there's a really nice uh, paper that kind of summarizes these uh, into three different categories. Um, uh, distributive, algebraic, holistic, uh, distributed, algebraic, and holistic. Um, and the, the way that these are defined is, uh, in terms of accumulators. So for the sum and average aggregates, what we can do is build up an accumulator that takes up a fixed amount of memory. Like we talked about earlier, uh, the sum, all you need is an integer or a uh, floating point number to carry around the total. With an average, uh, it's the same thing, you just need two separate integers. So the way that you can implement these operators is in terms of uh, a sort of accumulator function. Um, have two different operations, one of which uh, takes, my, takes uh, my total and adds, the, uh, adds it to, sorry, takes my total and adds whatever value I'm trying to aggregate onto the total. For things like average, where you need multiple values, uh, where you need to keep track of multiple values, uh, you also need sort of a finalized operation that takes that tuple, of, of that record of values that you've been keeping track of and converts it into the actual uh, number that you're, you're interested in. So uh, in the case of average, every time you get a new value, uh, you add that value to the total and you increment your count by one. And then at the very end, uh, you take your total and divide it by your count. Um, the, the three different classes of aggregate functions, uh, basically the first one, uh, algebra, uh, distributive um, operations are ones that don't need this finalized method. Uh, they're ones where the number that you're computing is always uh, the, at any point, that, that is the number that you're, you're summing up. Um, algebraic, uh, are operations that can be represent uh, aggregates that require a accumulator that uses a, only a fixed amount of memory. So either distributive or algebraic um, aggregates will both have a fixed working set size. Uh, there's also certain classes of 
aggregates that are uh, termed holistic, and uh, both median and mode are examples of this. Uh, they are aggregates where you basically need to keep around uh, essentially the entire relation, or close to it, um, in order to compute the aggregate. Uh, do, do, do. All right. Um, one last thing, and that's grouping. So when you're implementing group by operators, uh, we mentioned that uh, in the, for these operators, the working set size would be, excuse me, would be the number of groups that we're working with. Um, if the number of groups fits in memory, great, you're done. If it doesn't, you actually need to do something a little more, um, you need to take advantage of, uh, you need to be a little more uh, intelligent about how you, you do your data processing. Uh, one strategy would be to take the data and uh, partition it. So just like we partition the data based, uh, data using, uh, using the uh, external hash, hash join, uh, we can partition all of the data, do one quick scan, create a set of buckets, and then do an in-memory group by on just those buckets. What's another strategy that we could use? So we had um, hash join is one way to, uh, to do a join, and here we have Hashing is one way to do a group by aggregate. What other kind of join uh, approach did we have for uh, joins? Might be appropriate here. Sort? How would you use a sort? So how might you use a sort uh, to do this, uh, to do a group by aggregate? So, say again? Well, so what is a group by aggregate? You're, you're trying to take, uh, you have a group by attribute, and you're trying to find all of the other attributes that are, uh, all of the other rows that have an equal value of that attribute. Now, hashing does that very nicely because it allows you to uh, create bins where everything in the bin has the same group by attribute, or one of a fixed number of group by attributes. Could you use a sort in the same way? Okay, so how, what, uh, describe the algorithm. We just sort all the values based upon, based upon the group by attribute. So since the attribute is sorted order, so Good, so the other approach would be to take um, first, sort all of your data by the group by attribute. Uh, and because of the fact that all of the data is sorted, you're guaranteed that all of the group by terms are going to be contiguous. Um, every time you, uh, the group by value changes as you're scanning through, you can uh, flush that group back to disk and you never have to see it again. Good. So uh, just to summarize, uh, Today we talked about taking relational algebra operators and implementing them as well as the sort of extended operators that we talked about on Monday uh, and implementing them in a memory conscious way. Um, minimizing the amount of data that has to flow up and down the memory hierarchy and minimizing the amount of data that we have in memory at any given point in time. So are there any questions on this? All right, um, one final reminder, homework two is due on Monday, uh, and you have about two weeks, two and a half weeks for pro uh, checkpoint one. <laughs>